This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Um, okay, so the talk today is a little bit uh, experimental and I'm really keen on the feedback and uh, but some parts might not be very clear so please ask questions whenever you think something is unclear or uh, you think something is going grossly wrong. So this is to some extent joint work with a PhD student but actually it seems that I started working on this I don't know 10 years ago um, so, uh, Richard Heck has a paper on related topics and in the footnote he thanks uh, Jeff and me and obviously we must have thought about it. Uh, but I can't remember uh, much, Jeff also can't remember much, uh, which shows that logic is... Uh, that's one thing, uh, but that the epistemology of logic and mathematics should be platonic you just remember things you have done in an earlier life. Um, okay, so uh, the starting point uh, for, for this is that when we learn uh, to prove the, incom the Gödel incompleteness theorems, uh, we usually start by identifying uh, syntactic objects, sentences, formulae, and so on, uh, with numerical codes. So, that's usually stated in the beginning, we identify symbols with, and sequences of symbols, with uh, numbers. And um, for many purposes, uh, this is the right way to proceed, so there's nothing wrong with that. And, um, but there might be other contexts where this is actually problematic and where one could try to separate syntactic objects and their codes in number theory or wherever. So for instance, for the first incompleteness theorems, it's I think quite okay to say syntactic objects are numbers, you just prove the incompleteness of say PA, but when it comes to more intentional results, such as the second incompleteness theorem, then it might be interesting to separate uh, numbers from uh, syntactic objects. And um, so I would like to be uh, more careful about this and look in the prospects of separating this, especially in the context of, uh, of truth theories. So um, I would like to analyze our usual meta-theoretic uh, reasoning where we have something like that. Somebody claims just informally all axioms of piano arithmetic are true and all logical axioms are true and the logical rules preserve truth, um, hence all the theorems of piano arithmetic are true. There is some induction hidden there. Um, and hence piano arithmetic is consistent uh, because um, yeah, no, no, no contradiction is true. Therefore, the arithmetical sentence con PA is true. And there's, I mean, shifting from here, piano arithmetic is consistent. That's a syntactic claim, but it's arithmetical counterpart. That's now something completely different. And I would like to understand what's really going on here and to what extent arguments like this uh, can be formalized. So what I want to do is to formalize our meta-theoretic uh, reasoning. Uh, before really looking at that, I would like to review um, axiomatic truth theories for piano arithmetic. So this is well-known stuff, but I tweak it, I mean, uh, compared to my book a little bit, because I would like to apply the truth theory later to theories different from piano arithmetic, for instance, to set theory. Okay, so, um, I mean, this is basically piano arithmetic plus all induction axioms plus the Taskin clauses. I know this looks frightening, uh, but it's actually not much is going on here. So, uh, I, instead of using a truth predicate, I use a satisfaction predicate, which will make things easier if you don't have uh, names for all objects. And then we have, as the first axiom, uh, an axiom that tells us, uh, tells us when an atomic formula of the form vi, this is a variable, equals vj is true. Okay, so I should say all these quantifiers range over numbers. We are in, in piano arithmetic. We can code um, finite sequences, um, so that's no problem. So I say such a formula is satisfied by variable assignment if 
the value assigned to this variable is the same as the value of that variable. And I, I, it's very well known how to express all this in a piano arithmetic. I should perhaps explain this dot here. That expresses the function that takes two terms and returns the code for the formula, I mean, with the identity between the two terms. And um, I don't deal with function symbols here. Let's assume they have been eliminated, could be done, but it makes things even more awkward. So we will have predicates, for instance, for the product to be read as this is the product of this and this. Details won't be important, but it's the same, basically the same pattern as here. And we have only finitely many predicates. Okay, so this settles the truth of atomic formulae under some variable assignment. Then uh, this and this axiom uh, cover uh, the connectives. So if k is a formula of the language of arithmetic, that means without this extra predicate, then the negation of this formula is satisfied by variable assignment if the formula itself is not satisfied. So satisfaction commutes with uh, negation. Then if this is a formula, which is equivalent to K and L, our formulae, um, then a conjunction is satisfied by variable assignment if both conjuncts are. So no surprise there. And this down here is the usual clause for the universal quantifier. Um, sorry. Which says um, a universally quantified formula is satisfied by variable assignment if the formula without the quantifier is satisfied by all variable assignments that differ from this alpha at most in the i-th that is in the quantified variable. So it's a really standard task here, just everything expressed in uh, arithmetic. And just for simplicity, I assume alpha is actually can be applied to any argument, but it will differ only in finitely many arguments from, uh, from zero, which means it's basically finite, but in the other cases where it isn't defined, I just stipulate it's, it's zero. Okay, then uh, what's very well known, uh, we can now prove what Kreisel and Levy called global reflection. I think this is actually the term comes from Kreisel and Levy. Just means if a sentence is provable in piano arithmetic, uh, then it's true. Here we have satisfaction, it means if K is a formula provable in piano arithmetic, then it will be satisfied by arbitrary variable assignments. Um, the interesting thing, I mean, it's kind of obvious how to prove it, I guess. But actually, I started counting how often you use induction for that proof. I found three instances of induction. Uh, the first one is kind of obvious, namely, you want to give an induction on the length of proof. So all axioms are true, and then you say, well, it's preserved. Uh, truth is preserved under these, these rules. That's obvious, and that's one use of induction. And it is a kind of syntactic induction. But in order to prove that all axioms are true, you also need induction. I mean, you can't use the t-sentences in order to show that all axioms are true because there are infinitely many instances of induction, but you can use one specific instance of induction in the language with sat to prove that all, satisfaction, uh, that, uh, all induction axioms are true or satisfied. And there is an additional twist, namely, you also need a lemma that allows you to show that if you have two terms with the same value, then uh, substituting one with the other will preserve the truth value. And then again is a syntactic induction on the length of the formula or the length of the sentence. So three instances of induction, and this will become later important because I've already said some instances of induction are more syntactical and others are more uh, arithmetical, and that will become more precise later on. At any rate, what people have, uh, have argued is then, I mean, from this you very quickly get the consistency statement for piano arithmetic. You just plug in here some contradiction and something logical contradiction like that. And then this theory CT for compositional truth proves the consistency of piano arithmetic. And then there are a couple of people. 
Uh, so Leon, I think, was 1995. Five. Yeah. Ah, thanks. Uh, and then uh, Jeff had a paper, and Stuart got all the credits. Is that right? Um, but of course, I mean, the proof itself can be found, I mean, very, very early on. But they, uh, I mean, attacked true theoretic deflationism, saying that actually this shows that you get new substantial insights from a theory of truth. This is an arithmetical claim, which is not provable in piano arithmetic itself, according to Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. Hence, the theory of truth gives you new mathematical insights. Hence, it can't be, can't be a thin notion, whatever that means. I don't really want to go into this deflationism uh, uh, discussion here, but that, that was very roughly, I think, the argument. Could you say how complicated the induction is that's needed? Um, uh, the, the, the problem is a little bit, we need to apply these complexity measures to the language with T. And uh, I think basically just one quantifier in front of the T will do. So it's fairly little. Three. I'm confident. Uh, okay. And I mean, some people might get worried that uh, we are appealing to this intentional second incompleteness theorem, but you can prove non-conservativity by appealing to the first incompleteness theorem as well. So if we have the Gödel sentence, it's just a standard Gödel sentence claiming of itself that it's not provable in piano arithmetic, then we use global reflection here. Using the T sentence, which is provable in CT, we get the local reflection principle. This together with the diagonal property gives you not provable gamma, which is gamma. And this is what we usually say also informally, the Gödel sentence is true. And we get that uh, in this theory CT. So everything seems fine. OK, so uh, I thought at this point I might, might say a little bit more. This is really not the main line of the talk, but um, maybe illuminating uh, when you think about theories related to CT. So. Um, what happens if you restrict induction to induction in the arithmetical language? Then you get a theory which is conservative over piano arithmetic. That's perhaps not so surprising. There's a cut elimination proof for that. Uh, but people have thought that this is actually very similar to the case with arithmetical comprehension, ACA. And I mean, for ACA, you can show if you drop the second order induction uh, axioms, you can take an arbitrary model of PA and extend it to a model of the theory that just has the second order elementary comprehension axiom. This is not the case with the CT axioms. In fact, Lackland proved that um, if you have, if the model can be extended to a model of CT with arithmetical induction only, the model has to be recursively saturated. Kind of surprising. Um, so, in fact, this parallel between ACA and CT is actually not so direct. I mean, in the, in the presence of full induction, yes, they are notational variants of one another in a sense, because ACA defines the truth predicate that is, satisfies all the CT axioms, and you can also mimic uh, elementary comprehension in CT. But in the absence of full induction, they kind of come apart. Um, in particular, it also seems that maybe arithmetical comprehension has something to do just with the T sentences. Um, so in fact, if you want to, uh, to mimic the ACA comprehension axiom in CT, you only need the compositional axioms in order to handle second order parameters. Otherwise, just the T axioms, I mean with the free variable, would suffice. OK, anyway, so what we need is if you drop instances with SAT from CT, you get a conservative theory. Just a remark about what you get with weaker truth axioms if you have just the T sentences. 
then you will get a conservative theory at any rate, even if you have full induction. Also not a surprise, I mean, that's basically Tarski's result already. And, um, but just very recently, uh, I was wondering if you are given a model of PA, can you always extend it to a model of PA plus the T sentences? The answer is no. And I mean, to my knowledge, it was just proved fairly recently by, by Engström. And, and Fisser told me about that result. With the free variable, it's fairly straightforward, but yeah. Okay. Anyway. But what I would like to do is what happens if we now don't make this identification of, of syntactic objects with uh, numbers. So in particular, I've already said, well, some instances of induction seem more syntactic, others seem more uh, number theoretic, so how can we make this more precise? Then I would like to ask, I mean, once we've made that precise, what is really responsible for the non-conservativity? Uh, is this the, I mean, syntactic in induction with the truth predicate, or is it more number theoretic induction? Again, this is kind of still very, very imprecise, but will be made more precise. And that is important because, I mean, in this discussion between Jeff, Stewart on the one hand, and uh, Hartree Field on the other hand, uh, it was claimed by Field that actually, well, if you add more induction, that means you add more number theoretic content to the theory, and it's no surprise that you can prove new arithmetical theorems. Um, but I mean, once we have disentangled syntactic and arithmetical induction, then we might get more information. I mean, do we really need more arithmetical induction, or is it just basically syntax uh, we add to the theory? Um, yeah, then we can ask, I mean, things like the Gödel sentence or the consistency statement, is that something syntactic or is it really something number theoretic once we have done this entangle disentanglement? Um, yeah, and then how can we reconstruct these, these meta-theoretic uh, arguments in, in such a setting? Okay, so um, I would like to be a little bit more precise about this. Um, Nevertheless, it will be fairly general, and I just had some examples in mind, and it might be so gem general that it's just incorrect. Um, so please let me know when, when I'm, I'm too general. But the idea is that we have uh, an object theory. This is the mathematical theory, and we have a syntax theory. So O is the object theory, S is the syntax theory. I assume that I do not share um, any non-logical symbol. I mean, in fact, I will also assume that uh, we are in a, at least two-sorted language. More about that later. So, and the object theory I had in mind is something like set theory, some arithmetical theory, or maybe even an empirical theory, but I hardly ever think about such theories. Okay, so um, as our theory S for syntax, we should have a concatenation theory. But as usual in these settings, uh, I'll use uh, piano arithmetic for this purpose. Um, but it's actually not too hard to write down the concatenation theory because we don't need any self-reference which might make things more difficult. Um, this is basically, we can more or less use what Tarski had in the original paper as a concatenation theory. Uh, one worry is why piano arithmetic, why not uh, a very weak theory? I mean, it's very well known that we can do syntax in primitive recursive arithmetic, something like that. Um, my view on this is actually piano arithmetic is very natural, and when we give semantic arguments, I mean, at least I use uh, induction without any hesitation, so I just throw in full induction which is not unproblematic, that's just how I do things. And of course, this is the setting where we can really investigate what happens when we intend induction schemata. Okay, so the plan is now to basically to repeat everything and to develop the truth theory, but now without conflating syntactic objects and mathematical objects. So that is, uh, the mathematical objects are the objects from O and the objects the syntactic objects are these objects from S. Um, okay. Then 
um, we will need, I will also use sorted variables. So i, j, k, n, and so on are variables uh, from the syntax theory, I mean, number theoretic variables, and the object theory, which might be, for instance, set theory. Uh, for these, I will use the variables x, y, z, and so on. And then the theory to start with will be object theory plus syntax theory plus this binary uh, predicate uh, for satisfaction. But I will add more axioms. So that's just the starting point. Okay. So now this is where things become murky and, and less pleasant. This is the axiom I had for the case with arithmetic, where I didn't have the disentanglement. Uh, now I need to reformulate it in this language where I distinguish between syntax theory and the mathematical theory. Okay, so this has an atomic formula of this shape, so vi equals vj. That is satisfied by variable assignment if both variables are assigned the same value. Okay, so indices of variables are syntactic objects that by I keep here i and j. The problem is now, that's perhaps the first surprise, what are variable assignments? Uh, they are clearly not purely syntactic objects. They are also not clearly mathematical objects. They are mixed. They take you from a syntactical object that is a variable or index of a variable to a mathematical object. And what I did was just add a third realm of objects. Um, so that's a third sort of variable, alpha, beta, and so on. And um, for them, I need to add new axioms. Now, I mean, this looks a little bit like second order because alpha is treated here as, uh, as a function. Um, actually, one does not really need uh, to go second order. Actually, I prefer to think of it as, uh, as just a new sort of variable plus a predicate that tells you x, that is a mathematical object, is the value of the ith variable. And then that can be eliminated. But this makes the, I mean, the notation is already awkward enough. Sorry for that. Uh, so I try to keep it simple here. Okay, which might mean if you have a predicate, there's actually uh, a quantifier ranging over mathematical, over O objects hidden in there. Okay, after all these stipulations, I can write down the first axiom for truth, which involves yeah, really all three kinds of objects, syntactical objects, mathematical objects, and variable assignments. Um, you might be wondering if I hadn't used a satisfaction predicate, just a normal truth predicate, and then, I mean, mimic uh, 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 the quantifier case by using qu substitutional quantification over numerals. That does not really help because then you need a denotation function, which takes you from syntactic objects to objects of O. So you never get around adding an additional kind of quantifier or third theory. I don't quite know which theory of variable assignments I should use. Um, I mean, I've tried to keep it really simple. So what, what I uh, want to have is, given, um, given an object, I can set the, ith, the value of the ith variable to x, which means there's a variable assignment such as alpha of, of i is x. And then the second axiom just tells you, given a variable assignment, I can change just a single value in any arbitrary value x. And that will allow me, just making these assumptions, to uh, formulate the truth axioms and to prove the basic things about uh, satisfaction. Um, right, I do not really want to explain how this actually can be rewritten with a predicate rather than functions. Okay, the good news is, okay, now after having explained what that now means, um, I have to browse through the other axioms, and they just can be kept. 
keeping in mind this ranges over syntactic objects, well, formulae are syntactic objects. <coughs> this is a variable assignment, and then we can just leave things as they are. Of course, these predicates, I mean, these predicates uh, for, for case of formula uh, of the language of O, this formula is now a formula in the syntactic language. No surprise there. Um, this is, I mean, all this can be expressed now in, in, in the syntax language. Um, the only kind of interesting axiom is, is this one, um, because here again we have this uh, quantification over, um, over variable assignments, and if you I mean, explain that with a predicate, you will see there are also quantifiers ranging over O objects hidden in there, which is kind of interesting because really the contact with the real objects, the objects of O is made in these two axioms. Not surprising, I mean, this is basically like in, in a formal model. This tells you how the predicates are interpreted. And of course, the model comes in also here. You need to know what the range of, uh, of the quantifiers is. Okay, so I call this uh, new theory CTS, compositional truth, and the S stands for syntax. Okay, anything else? No. Can I ask you a couple of sure, questions? Sure, sure. So your syntax axioms are piano arithmetic, mm -hmm. but you've still got zero success in plus and time. So is zero, what are you thinking? Is zero, what is zero? It's one of the syntactic arithmetic. It's a code of one of the syntactic arithmetic. Yeah, I mean, that would be nice if I could think of all the number theoretic objects, of, of all the numbers as syntactic objects. And presumably you're going to use for um, primitive predicates of the O language, you, you're going to use quine quotes P. Is that going to be, that's going to be a syntactic item? That's going to be syntactic. Um, right. I mean, for instance, th th this one? Yeah. Um, or is that a number? It's well, a, it must what's, be a syntactic item. Yeah, it's a syntactic item. So, of course, well, now I need the, the blackboard. So, this formula, I don't know, that's of course a formula in the language O. Uh, say, say we have set theory. In set theory, we have formulae like this. But then we have a function that takes two variables and gives you the formula vi element vj. Um, and that function can be represented in piano arithmetic. And I write, say, or for this function. So this is a function in number theory. To make things worse, piano arithmetic might not have a function for that unless we have function symbols for all primitive recursive uh, functions. And I said that at the beginning, I don't have function symbols in the language. I mean, so, yeah. your, your syntactic items are really just unary strings. Is that right? And then you're, you're identifying your P's and so on with, with those items. Yeah, I mean, in the. Uh, I try to, to, to cheat by saying, well, S is talking directly about strings of symbols. Yes. And I achieve that via PA. Yeah. Well, you, you, you didn't actually tell us what syntactic objects are. Right? No. Because you don't really need to know what this is. It's just yes. so far you told us yeah. they're governed by certain axioms. Really yeah, 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 yes. yeah. And, and that's pretty much it. So in a sense, it doesn't matter what we identify. Zero, we have a what yeah. operations on these syntactic yeah. items, successor and plus and time. Yeah, but yeah. it's supposed to be a subdomain of, the, of our whole universe of discourse that is disjoint from whatever you know set theory is talking about or something like that, right? We have to keep it apart. That's at least or maybe that, that's the picture. That's the picture, it, right? Actually, I do not have to make that assumption uh, because I will never. They could, make they able could to fall apart. They could fall apart. Yeah. But uh, let's think they are really apart. Right. Uh, otherwise, it's hellish. No. But basically, it's about dividing up the universe of discourse in three domains, right? Subdomains, right? Sort of the objects that the theory that we're interested in or the language that we're interested in is talking about, right? The, synth the syntactical yeah. objects and the variable assignments. Like, yes. Like maybe yeah. Semantic yeah. So, so standard model is, let's say, our theory O is set theory. 
Then there's the set theoretic universe. Um, that's the domain of O. Then there is, then there are this uh, syntactic expressions of the language of set theory, which is a very small one, I mean, countable uh, uh, realm of objects. And then we have variable assignments that map some of the syntactic objects, namely the variables, into the set theoretic universe. Yeah. And basically, so far, it's about that, right? And then additionally, you have axioms, so you're specifying those. And, and so far, is it all part of the game that there are special axioms for these subdomains? And is, is that also something yeah. that's important? It's, you hinted at that. Yes. When you say PA, I use as a theory of syntax. Yes. So, uh, so, so, so we, 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 we can prove certain things about, uh, about syntax. Um, I mean, of course, I mean, in order to be able to express these things, uh, I need to assume that. I mean, I can say what a formula is, and for that I use arithmetic. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and CT2, I mean, these axioms, they are now talking about all of these three subdomains at the same time, right? Yes. So this is supposed to be the semantical theory that puts all the things together, yeah. right? That's the picture. Uh, it's not only a, I mean, a semantic theory. I mean, you have, say, if our theory O is set theory, Samuel Frankel. Yeah. No, I mean oh. CT2. CT2. Oh, okay. That's genuine yeah. Yeah. semantic. Axiom, right? And it's talking about all the three subdomains at the same time. So right. right. I mean, that variable, I mean, so we have, uh, yeah. I mean, syntactic variables in there. We have a, vari uh, a variable ranging over these assignments. Um, there's no direct. Yeah. About the objects that Them, are themselves. Themselves. Yeah. 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 I mean, in particular in, in, in these two. Okay. So, I mean, that, that's really the problematic part. Uh, I won't prove any deep insights, just writing down things is really awkward. <laughs> right, so this, this is the theory CTS where we really now have yeah, these uh, three kinds of objects. Can you think of it as something like Tarski's original approach, but exactly. an axiomatic presentation rather than defined predicates? Yes, set yes, form, yes. Putting primitive predicates in axioms. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what Tarski did. I mean, he, I, mean, yeah, I mean, that's why I have O object theory. Then you write down syntactic axioms. <coughs> That's what Tarski did. Yeah. And then I don't define truth, but rather say some, uh, just have it as a primitive predicate that is, uh, is axiomatized. Yes. OK, so now what do we get in that uh, theory? Actually, it's not, 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 not terribly important just to explain the notation a little bit more. In the theory CTS, we can get the T sentences. Um, I mean, we have satisfaction, so we even get it with a free variable. Uh, so that means now phi is a formula of the O language, say set theory. And then this means such a formula of set theory is satisfied by a variable assignment if and only if phi of, and now I have to plug in the value of the variable vi for the free variable. And of course, I could do it with, with more than one free variable. So I get this. I have a quantifier, qu quantifier over the variable assignments. SAT is, of course, this new predicate. Um, spelling out this, this is a syntactic object. And here, this um, uh, on the right hand side, this is really purely in O except for the alpha. OK. Oops, sorry. Yeah, uh, now I went back to the proof of the global reflection principle. I mean, the principle, all theorems of the object theory are true. So, I mean, if everything was just in arithmetic, I was able to prove that uh, all theorems of piano arithmetic are true or all theorems are satisfied. And, I mean, actually, we can recover that proof. So, this is now a predicate in the syntax language, and this is now where I really use the axioms. Um, and if I can prove a formula in O, then that formula is satisfied by arbitrary variable assignments. And um, yeah, I will need, um, again, various uh, instances of, of induction. Well, first, I need, again, syntactic induction just because it's a proof on the length of, of proofs, of proofs in O. Uh, but I also need to show that all axioms of O are true. And this 
where this assumption comes in. So if I have, I, I can just use, I mean, my T sentences, if I've got an axiom of O, then I know it's satisfied using uh, this equivalence. The problem is if by O is piano arithmetic, semilo frankel set theory, I would have to show that all instances of replacement are true, I would have, or I would have to show that all instances of induction are true, because these theories are not finitely axiomatized. And then, of course, I won't get very far with the T sentences. That's why I have to say only finitely many axioms. But if that's given, uh, plus the syntactic induction on replacing terms, but yeah, that, then I get the, uh, the global reflection principle. And from that, I get the consistency again. So O doesn't prove any contradiction. Um, now this is in so far um, strange because now CTS proves the consistency of O that looks as if we, I mean, usually we would add Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. That can't be provable in O, in fact. It's not provable in O. But this is now really, I mean, defined in terms of this provability predicate and that this is, is a syntactical predicate. So I can prove the consistency of O, but since this is not in the language of O, this is not a new O theorem. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we don't have any more this result that adding this truth theory gives us a new theorem in the object theory. Uh, and in fact, I can prove it that we don't get anything new. So that there's this, uh, I mean, I think it can... Can I just ask a question about the previous result? Yeah. In, in order to prove that uh, each uh, theorem is true, mm -hmm. you need to have each O axiom added Compositional truth. Yeah, I mean, CTS contains, contains S o. and O. Contains O, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's so all CTS there. CTS plus O. Because um, I, I, over the years I've seen people make this, make this discussion. We don't want our theory of truth to prove consistent with piano arithmetic. Ah, so okay. That, that's not what's being argued. It's that yeah. the theory of truth should add to combine with piano arithmetic to prove its consistency, combine with O to prove its consistency. Yeah. So, Okay, so. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, so uh, in fact, I, I, I think it's, if I haven't made a mistake, it should be fairly easy to prove that this theory doesn't add anything new to O. Because take a model of this mathematical theory, my favorite example is set theory, and then the claim is, any such model can be extended to a model of this full theory. And of course, I need to say how to get to extend this model, I mean, to the syntax theory and to the truth theory and to, uh, I mean, theory of variable assignments. Uh, but the theory has very little interaction between the O theory and the syntax theory and all the rest. So think, think of it in, in the following way. Given any model of set theory can be non-standard, whatever, doesn't, doesn't matter. We can define satisfaction for that model in our usual meter language. That's not a problem. I mean, formulae and so on are just standard. And take that as the model for, for CTS. That's all that's going on. So I can interpret variable assignments, syntax, and the truth predicate just in the standard way. Um, okay. Um, which is kind of strange because, um, I mean, very often say that people say that adding a truth predicate makes the theory much stronger. What does that exactly mean? I mean, that theory will be able to interpret, uh, I mean, under certain reasonable assumptions, will be able to interpret. Uh, o, because we can prove consistency, so we can exploit the known theorem that, say, PA plus the consistency of set theory interprets uh, um, uh, set theory, so that will interpret set theory, O is, is, is set theory, but on the other hand, we, get a, we don't get any new set theoretic uh, uh, theorem. Okay. So, 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 we go back to the previous slide. 
I mean, then we also know, okay, we have con o, um, which is now in, 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 in syntax, right? Mm -hmm. not, not in the language of o, right? That was the point. But we know that there is a corresponding statement in the language of o, right? Where you just map things to other things, right? Yeah. Which we couldn't have. Yeah. And we couldn't prove that there is this correspondence, right? Because otherwise we would have a problem with that. So mm -hmm. there's something still that is sort of that we know from the outside, but the model couldn't know that it just constructed, right? So yeah, and, and that, that's, that's exactly what I find so strange. What's going on? I mean, usually we are very quick in saying, I mean, that, that that's the, was the first slide where I said, well, say piano arithmetic is consistent. That seems to be a syntactic claim. Hence, the arithmetized consistency claim is true. What's going on? Something like that. that that's, think of con O, that's in the language of S, as this informal syntactic claim. Uh, um, piano, uh, well, set theory is consistent. What we don't get is the corresponding claim in the language of set theory, where syntactic objects are coded yeah. as, uh, as sets. And that's, of course, because our SAT predicate applies to syntactic objects and not to codes, to set theoretic codes or formulae of set theory. Yeah. I'll say, yeah. So you can add a function symbol expressing the Gödel coding as primitive. Function symbol mapping each primitive of the syntax theory to a set. As soon as you've got the sequence coding, then that will translate from one to Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, I'm more, yeah. Um, okay, so um, I mean, one question one could ask I mean, so far, uh, sorry, um, here I've assumed finite axiomatizability. What, oh sorry, then there's, uh, I just wanted to look at the case, what happens to the Gödel sentence in, in such a setting? Um, okay, so the real, normal Gödel sentence uh, for O, I mean, assuming we have got names for the codes and so on, so it's very, very precise, but then we can find gamma equivalent to not provable gamma, where we now have a defined provability predicate in the language of O. I mean, that's still possible, of course. Uh, but it's different from the provability predicate on, on the previous slide. Um, and of course, there's no way how we can prove this gamma, uh, because we can't argue with the satisfaction predicate, because that doesn't apply to codes of sense. It applies directly to the syntactical objects. What we can do, of course, is we can also look at it from the viewpoint of this predicate, of the syntactic predicate, and diagonalize that because our syntax theory allows for that. Um, but that, I mean, delta is then just purely, uh, I mean, syntactical. Um, and um, I mean, in fact, that will contain syntax that won't tell you anything about what is provable in, in, in O. So, First incompleteness theorem doesn't do anything here. It just, yeah. Okay, so in the next, uh, uh, the next question is, I mean, if we have uh, an object theory that is not finitely axiomatizable, set theory, uh, <coughs> piano arithmetic, something like that, we still would like to prove uh, global reflection. But there the problem is, how do we prove that all these axioms are true? How, why are all instances of replacement true? Why are all instances of induction true? Um, okay, so what we can do is, um, we can ex extend the schema of the object theory to the full language. So basically there the idea is uh, very, very roughly, sorry. Um, we might have something like, um, I don't know, induction. Then for n true phi n true phi n plus one. So just this is an instance of, of induction. If we have that, then we use the compositional axioms to pull out the t in front of, of this. I mean, we can have this for all phi. 
And then we basically have all instances of induction are true. We can do the same here, but that requires that we have an instance of induction that contains the truth predicate in front. It's a very simple in, uh, instance, but we need that. And one can basically run the same argument for replacement or separation or whatever you might have as an axiom schema. And then the question arises, so if we do not only extend, I mean, we have induction, of course, in the full, I mean, the, the, the induction schema of the syntax theory, that's always extended to the full language. But what about the object theory? Um, I mean, it seems to me as soon as I start to apply the schemata from the object theory to the full language, I might, I will lose conservativity. I don't have a very general claim here that might depend on the theory. So, but what I had in mind, uh, if I have partial truth predicates, which we will have, say, for piano arithmetic and, 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 and set theory, then I might try to get a truth predicate for the codes, not for syntactic objects, but for the codes. And I think I can do that basically again by saying that there is a partial truth predicate, say so sigma n truth predicate, that applies to, to x. So this truth predicate out here allows me to quantify over the indices of the partial truth predicates. So this, I mean, if, if my object theory is set theory, this should define truth on the set theoretic codes. And when that becomes definable, I should be able to, I mean, to prove consistency using this set. So um, this natural move, extending the schemata of the object theory to the full language will allow me to prove the global reflection principle, but I will lose conservativeness. Um, now, that seems to support uh, Hartree Field's point of view. So, um, this is, is for, for, for Jeff. Um, that's what Field more or less claimed. He said, okay, we, we, we can have all these uh, um, induction schemata in, in, in the syntax language, but we lose conservativity only by making new mathematical assumptions. And this is exactly what happens here. Uh, only when I start to extend the schemata of O, I lose conservativity. So um, you have to ask a question about that later and to complain. Um, yeah, and then I, I can use new, uh, prove new substantial theorems, but no surprise if I add new mathematical uh, assumptions. So um, this is basically where, I'm at, where I am. Um, but still, CTS seems to be a very odd theory. So I don't know whether I've gone completely wrong, but it seems that people like Heck seem to be very fond of this, this approach. Um, because what usually happens, um, we say piano arithmetic is consistent, but then we immediately pass on to the claim that the arithmetized consistency statement is true. What's going on there? I mean, this step definitely doesn't work in this theory CTS. What's missing? Um, yeah, so in our usual meta-theoretic reasoning, I guess we are talking explicitly about coding functions. That's what Jeff said. Um, I'm kind of, I, I would like to know, uh, is there anything I missed? Because people usually claim coding functions have to be recursive. But what exactly is going on here? We have a realm of syntactic objects and we have codes. And a coding function is something that takes the syntactic objects to their codes. Calling that function recursive is not so straightforward because usually recursive function is something that deals with natural numbers and not with some other objects mapped on, uh, on, on syntactic objects. So how could we develop a theory of, of coding functions? Of course, we can just add them, pick a coding function and, and then add, add that uh, by brute force. I mean, in the case we have as our object theory uh, set theory, there might be a, a much more natural way. Namely, what happened was, I mean, the, the syntax theory and set theory do not really nicely interact in this setting. In particular, whatever I do to all these uh, schemata, 
the set theoretic part will still be a theory of pure sets without Ur elemente. And what I could do is, in order to get more interaction, I could say, well, these syntactic objects can be used in, uh, in, in sets as Ur elemente. Um, the reason why I don't get that, even by extending, say, the separation schema, is that the separation schema starts with a universal quantifier, or you know, well, has, has, has the universal for all x is in this set if and only if so and so. And that's a set theoretic quantifier, so the separation uh, axiom, even when extended to the full language, just tells me something about pure sets, not whether syntactic objects are elements of, of sets. But if we do that and we also allow syntactic objects as Ur elements, then, um, I mean, then we should be able to define sequences of, um, of these symbols and then we have this collapse and we will be able to pass from, say, the consistency statement for syntactic, the syntactic consistency statement to the corresponding consistency statement about codes. And so we actually get a new theorem in the object theory. What kind of worries me? I mean, so how we think about coding functions might depend a little bit on, on what kind of uh, object theory we have. I mean, obviously, this is very specific to set theory. Okay, so here are, I mean, as I said, it's work in progress, um, some preliminary conclusions. So if the syntax theory and the object theory are separated in the way I, I've proposed, yeah, we can still prove consistency and think uh, um, and prove consistency and so on. Um, yeah, and for, yeah, for uh, infinitely axiomatized theory, we also need to extend the schema of the object theory. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of imprecise. I've always assumed we have only finitely many schemata. Theories are strong enough. But, um, okay, then the reason why we can prove consistency is mainly uh, the extended syntactic induction schema. Only when we have an infinitely axiomatized object theory, we need to extend that. And uh, I mean, in order to conclude anything about the meta theory, uh, yeah, about sentences in O, in particular about the codes of, um, of sentences, I mean, codes in, in, in O, uh, yeah, we need to add further assumptions. I mean, something like coding functions. Um, and only then we will be able to reason semantically about, about these codes. Um, now, this is kind of disappointing. So, I think in this setting, something goes something grossly wrong, but I would really like to know what exactly is going wrong. Uh, in the end, I would still hope that we get this kind of collapse, because usually we are so quick in saying, yeah, piano arithmetic is consistent, hence the arithmetized consistency statement, and usually with some qualifications, the natural one and so on, that's true. What exactly is going on? And I would like to see that formalized. I'm sure it can be done somehow, but exactly which axioms have to be added to that uh, setting? And I think that's very important when one thinks like the way Pfefferman thinks about these things. He would say, uh, well, we start with piano arithmetic. Um, it's incomplete. Let's add the consistency statement. I mean, progressions. Uh, proposed initially by, by Turing. Um, so the Gödel state of the consistency statement is obviously true. Let's add, we should add that as a new axiom. There seemed to be this gap. Yeah, it's consistent. We should, add, I mean, accept consistency, uh, uh, the consistency claim, but why should we add the arithmetized uh, consistency claim? Pfefferman has thought very carefully about what is a natural consistency predicate, but he has always, I mean, made this assumption syntactic objects are really uh, identified with their codes. And I mean something, I mean from, from Pfeffman's word might be applied to this. Okay, so, so I think uh, we need to get more clear about these things, at least I do, uh, when we uh, think about incompleteness and adding reflect, proof theoretic reflection principles um, to a starting theory such as piano arithmetic. Um, okay, so 
you know, some more remarks, but they, even, they are even more confused than what I've said so far, so I better stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much.